I'd like to, to introduce um, Professor Richard Sayre from Stanford University, professor of chemistry, um, who has actually been um, a friend of the Pufendorf Institute even before the beginning as a um, good friend and collaborator of our first director, Sture Foshean, who's here. And we're really happy to have you here. Uh, it's actually Zoom, not Skype. And uh, I'm going to give you the word now. I hope you can hear me well. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Very and, good. And I'm delighted to, to, to join you remotely. I wish I were present, um, but it's not been possible. I, I would like um, this afternoon, your afternoon, to talk about the founding of Stanford's BioX program and tell you about it. And, and uh, I think I'll begin by explaining to you, it really is a matter of joys and woes. It started with many woes, but it's lately turned into many joys. This is a matter of interdisciplinary research. So I'd like to give you first my overview about interdisciplinary research. There are a number of factors contributing to um, and I've listed them on the screen, organizational form and spatial distribution. Um, generally, we find the closer people are in proximity to each other, they can interact. But today with the internet, it's possible to actually have successful collaborations that are all around the globe. The modes of interaction, the object of the collaboration, and people's personalities and, and positions, and, and then a sense of gains and losses, which is really important. Uh, there has to be a feeling of everybody gaining or it won't work. And this turns out to be, in many cases, a big stumbling block. So what are the drivers to make this happen? You hear generally where I live in my country, one federal agency after another, like a mantra, tell you about the importance of interdisciplinary work. But in many, many ways, it's hard to achieve this. Um, what, what goes on? First of all, there's the lure of solving complex problems. It turns out that a number of people with different points of view can really make progress where no one themselves can solve the whole problem. Generally, there's a sense that there'll be more funding. That does drive things very much. There'll be more impact. It's also possible for people to publish in more than one space because of different expertise. And so the same work gets better known in, in a number of places and therefore has more impact. Now, Let's talk about the nature of interdisciplinary studies. Knowledge arrives as a whole in the world about us. Universities disintegrate knowledge department by department. That's what normally goes on. That's been the history and tradition of universities. And the discovery, that's the challenge. Now, I, I want to begin by stressing the importance of departments, because there are some people, that even one university recently, that thought they could do without having any departments. Okay. I, I wanted to start by stressing to you the importance of departments, after having first told you that departments actually tear things apart. The tar departments are the keepers of the truth of some field. Um, these are the people who stand up and are really uh, have the most rigorous understanding of what constitutes certain fields and uh, are very much interested in protecting that field and championing that field. And it's my experience, you cannot have strong interdisciplinary programs without its members having strong disciplinary strengths. So in no way am I saying, let's do away with departments. That's not what, what I'm saying. What I need is something else. And here's the challenge. Do departments look inward or outward? And we've had a lot of trouble, at least here at Stanford in the beginning, and that many people in departments were fearful if we get involved in an interdisciplinary program, which I'm about to describe, that we're going to lose these people. They will not be now really full-time members of the department. And uh, there was a lot of opposition to, for example, my own interest in getting involved in something called BioX, which I'll get to. Um, and this is a, a real question here. Some, some people in the department say, yes, our field is so important 
indeed, as you go out and interact with other fields, you will teach these other fields about the importance of our department. Others say, no, we're losing a colleague. This is very much a tension. This tension doesn't go away. It's part of what goes on. And now here come some issues in team science that, are, that I think are pretty obvious with people working together. And it's a matter very much of communication as shown in this slide here. <laughs> you could have terrible disasters without communication. This generally means that teams need to learn the different members, how each other speaks about what. Often there's a lingo to each field, a, a certain way of describing things. And you have to be willing to take, have the patience and the flexibility to master that lingo to communicate. That's part of it all. The, the, the other thing are, we have to look at what are the expectation of all coworkers. Only by working together with people feeling that they, they are, each one of them is winning, is it possible to have this teamwork succeed? Here's a bunch of characters, cats and dogs that don't no normally uh, cooperate. Um, but as I, I said at the bottom of this particular cartoon, uh, it can have its sweet rewards. And here they are getting a cake out of the refrigerator together. Um, so here's the goal, diverse groups working together making creative contributions to complex problems at the cutting edge and extreme, extending themselves to individually unreachable heights. That's team science at its best. That's something that's to be very much strived for. Now, just personally, just some, some experiences that I've had, uh, which will help you understand where I'm coming from. I was an undergraduate with a double major in chemistry and physics. Um, I ended up in graduate school with a PhD in chemical physics. I was a postdoc at the Joint Institute for Laboratory Astrophysics, now called JILA, um, in, at the University of Colorado. I began a professor first at MIT. Uh, I was at MIT in the chemistry department, then at the University of Colorado. I was in the physics and astrophysics department. Then I became a joint member of both physics and astrophysics and chemistry. <laughs> um, and I moved later to Columbia University as a full professor in chemistry with an appointment in the physics department, uh, department's radiation laboratory in Pupin Hall. So I've, I've seen interactions between different departments. I've, I've had service on the IBM Science Advisory Committee when they had one. Um, they uh, actually unfortunately got rid of their Science Advisory Committee when the committee I was on reported that some uh, upstart company uh, uh, should not really be given all the software business that Microsoft was being given. So the answer was to shoot the messenger. Um, I've been chair of the National uh, Academy of Sciences Committee to establish science and technology centers in the, in the National Science Foundation. An interesting story in that case. Uh, Eric Block came to us and wanted to set up science and technology centers, which were gonna be new. Uh, people were very afraid that this would cut into individual grants. And Eric wa wanted to ask our committee for advice. Should he have one on superconducting materials or two centers on superconducting materials? We told him that he, we, he should listen to what the community proposes uh, as to what they want to do and choose amongst them that he should not himself decide what are the science and technology centers. Now, what's the beginning of BioX? It came about when Steve Chu at Stanford University had an offer to leave to go to the University of Chicago. Steve Chu is a Nobel laureate in physics. Uh, University of Chicago wanted to set up a biophysics program. Steve asked us to meet in his office. Jim Spudich, who's in the School of Medicine, Lucy Shapiro, also in medicine, Lucy Shapiro would become later director of the Beckman Center. Uh, Jim Spudich would, I think, win many prizes for his work on muscles uh, and, and, and how, how we have contraction and such, and, and myself. We met in his office, and he wanted to know why I should stay at Stanford. And in discussing this, <clears throat> he kept pointing out the, that we wanted to have biophysics, and this was not going to happen at Stanford. 
And we said we thought we could. And I said there was more to things than just biophysics. There was, you know, biochemistry and bioengineering and biomedicine. And um, indeed, after a while, um, I suggested that we, why don't we just call it BioX, where X could stand for the unknown and it would be, be around the, the bio area. Uh, they like this name and we put it forward. Uh, this would not have happened without the support of the university and, and truly. Uh, and so this is how this center started to come about. It really was a faculty idea, but it could not happen without strong administrative support. In 2000, ground was broken to house BioX in a new building uh, designed by Norman Foster and Associates, the same people who made, for example, the Millennium Bridge or the Hong Kong Airport. Um, and it's, a, it's a three stories tall and has about 146,000 square feet. It is a home of BioX, but BioX is, is bigger than that. There are people in BioX who are not in that home. In 2003, the opening of the Clark Center, we, we got Jim Clark to actually uh, put up some money for this. He was a former Stanford faculty member who founded several notable Silicon Valley companies as shown here like Silicon Graphics and Netscape and so on. Um, uh, it, matters became very complicated when after Clark pledged money, he then cut his pledge in half. But fortunately, uh, the university led that time by President Gerhard Casper came to the rescue and was willing to use his own discretionary funds to let BioX be born. Now, what's it like today? Here's what's happening. We have something like 600 faculty and thousands of other scientists across campus who work together to conduct collaborative research. Its governance is by, the, is by three deans, uh, quite amazing. Three different schools, that of medicine, that of engineering, and, and that of humanities and sciences to, to which I belong. And we also have a director which is the fourth person, and that's now Professor Carlos Schatz, who set policy and decide 30 issues, such as space allocations and the Clark Center. Uh, Steve Chu had hoped to become director. Um, people uh, had not been happy with how forceful his style was. Instead, Jim Spudich was made the beginning director. He's, and Steve actually would first leave and go to um, uh, UC Berkeley, uh, where he was head of uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs, then later became Secretary of Energy under Obama before returning to Stanford, where he's now in bio, back in BioX. Here's a picture of what it looks like, very open, very much you'll see the idea is to have uh, no great walls separating things. And here we have a conference in, in the central courtyard as shown here with posters. Uh, here's more pictures of it, and you get to see the architecture and how open it is and how it's visible everywhere. Everybody gets to see what everyone else is doing. People are mixed up from all different disciplines and interact with each other. So uh, I, on my own floor, because I do have space in BioX, uh, I'm next to a person, uh, Professor Elbert Foreman, who's, who's doing microbiology and so on, and, and, and it's fine. It really, it turns out, uh, we really help each other in different ways. And yet another view of what it's like. Uh, so what is BioX, if I might? What, what is it that we're talking about in this? And here's an overview. Unique pioneering initiative on evolving multiple dis disciplinary biosciences, accelerating scientific discovery and innovation, understanding entire organ systems and all their complexity, it has a whole bunch of programs. I'll be emphasizing a couple of these to you. I'll be particularly emphasizing what's called their seed grants, their interdisciplinary seed grants, and their fellowships. There's other things they do, as well as corporate forum and so on, workshops. All types of affiliations. Um, and as I mentioned to you, uh, the, the nature of it, it's now spread to different schools. We even have the, the law school involved, involving bioethics. Uh, and indeed, that's an important area. And 60 plus departments have, have now entered into this. It didn't start that way. So the training platform for all researchers, and you see the areas it, it covers, is quite large. Here's a picture again of the, of the building, James H. Clark Center. 
which is the hub. Um, and it, it houses about 50 faculty from 28 departments, open lab space, three stories high, as I've mentioned to you. There are another aspect I wanna point out, and this may be surprising that I first tell you this. It's so important to have a place to eat, a place to have coffee and tea. A lot of where people meet there and you have a table space, which is not just private booths. You have open tables where people sit down next to other people and talk about what they're doing, what's on their mind, and to bring all this together. Uh, and of course, there's meeting places and conference rooms, and you'll see that. Other things are shared resources. Uh, and I'm, I'm starting to show you some. Here's the Clark Center, here's Stanford University. There's plenty, as you can read from this slide. And I don't want to dwell on this, but you can see these all these possibilities. People like Michael Levitt, who's been involved in, 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 in uh, the BioX, and involved in supercomputers and such, uh, and in bioinformatics. All types of possibilities that go on, from animal facilities uh, to mass spectrometry laboratories uh, to uh, NMR facilities. And if I might. What really makes this program go in different ways? Okay, here's the question about what is the heart of, of BioX? To me, they are seed grants, which I'll explain to you, and they are fellowships that, that bring people together. BioX does not give a degree in BioX or in interdisciplinary anything. The degrees are still kept by the departments. People belong to departments. They may belong to more than one department in some case but they belong to departments. This is really a place that is a, a hub, a nexus that brings people together. And here are the C grants for success, the Interdisciplinary Initiative Programs, IIP. They are two-year C funding, okay? There have been eight rounds funded so far for a total of 187 awards, 900 plus interdisciplinary teams created, uh, and you can sort of look at this diagram and get a sense of it, um, of, of all the interactions that go on. 88 plus patents, 88 plus patents filed so far from the 187 awarded uh, projects. And I, I wanna stress to you, we have made an analysis of this. There has been a tenfold or more return on the investment, on the money that's been spent to make this program go, to seed things, we get so much more. Uh, I don't know what it's like in the various countries where you come from, but, in, but in, in the United States, in many cases, unless you have preliminary results, there's no way you can get funded. A good idea is insufficient to get funded. You must show that it already has some traction. And this is why these C grants are so important. And I'm showing you on this next slide, something about the various rounds. As I've told you, there's been eight rounds. You can see the letters of intent, the proposals, and the number of awards that were made uh, to, to, and how this has gone along. Uh, it's a very important part. And of course, this means there has to be funding for it. Not much funding, but funding. And, it, and it's, it's been paid off very well to, to Stanford to have this type of funding. So here is a success measure for BioX. Okay. Uh, and I want to mention to you, it has increased the number of collaborations because we insist that every project have more than one group that works on it to be funded. You have to have people who are going to reach out between groups. A single group will not get funded with a BioX seed grants. It's really uh, such that it wants people to work together. The increased funding to Stanford, as I've mentioned to you, tenfold. And Publications and, 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 and patents have really ensued from this type of work. Um, now, translating BioX, okay, cor corporate um, forum program. So we uh, are fostering stronger academic industry relations through the BioX uh, portal. We have all these different companies involved that have been interested in working with people at BioX. A lot of companies have actually come out of BioX, as I'll point out to you as we go on. Um, so th this has been qu quite successful. 
Now we're willing to do things that have no corporate sponsorship as well, but many things involve corporate sponsorship. Next thing I'm turning to are fellowships, support of graduate students and postdocs. We've had something like 248 PhDs and eight postdocs awarded so far for three-year interdisciplinary fellowships. These are self-nominations. People go around and propose themselves who want to get such a fellowship. They're required to have more than one person who supervises their thesis if they're a graduate student. We, we, we really believe in co-mentoring. There's a lot of advantages to that we've found. There's been 14 rounds of fellowships since 2004. Um, and uh, this is very much in, investing in the future. And I'm gonna show you that as to what's happened to these people. Let's ask the question, where are the fellows that have been supported? And it's fascinating. 148 fellows fully graduated, 28% in startups, 56% are either founded by them or they're the CEO of the startup. And uh, we see industry, we see academia, uh, we got about that, that, that number, they've gone on to be faculty, about one third. Uh, interestingly, we're not getting anyone to go into the government. I don't know why. <laughs> that isn't what happens from this, from this program. People go on, uh, and maybe it's part of the entrepreneurial spirit that pervades Stanford. Um, and so if I might, I, I now want to try to come to some conclusions from this. Uh, BioX started out with a great deal of pain uh, and with many people having misgivings. Since then, I think now it's, it's considered to be one of the jewels in Stanford's crown. Team science is an incredibly complicated and interesting social phenomena. It's a candy store for social scientists and I'm sure there are people <laughs> at your meeting who are, who are enjoying the candy and taking different flavors. We have made, begun to make some progress on answering a very difficult question. Under what conditions is team science effective or ineffective? We think we have some ideas, but I'd like to close with one major idea I believe in very strongly, and it's this. This is the challenge to policymakers. And, and, and I, I really think this is important what I'm saying here. You really need to talk to all the stakeholders, all the people who have a stake in what will come about and, and understand their interest in this to make the thing work. There has to be a sense that everybody is winning something by proceeding in an interdisciplinary way. And your task is not to see into the future. The ability of individuals or, or groups of people to foresee the future has been shown again and again to be <laughs> fraught with problems and with uh, amusing faults, okay? <laughs> Your task is to enable the future to unfold. The right type of administration and spirit really can lead to team science and accomplish things which no member of the team can do alone. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we are very glad that you're here in this way anyway, and it worked perfectly once we got it up again. Um, Great, thank you. Yes. So uh, do we have any questions for Richard? Yes, um, Michael O'Rourke, Michigan State. Thank you very much for the talk and for your persistence. Um, I'm curious if you might say a little bit more about the graduate fellowship. Um, program that you have, the fellowship program. So for, in particular, what sort of infrastructure do you, have you built for that program? What sorts of things do you expect the fellows to do to, in, in, you know, while they're funded to acquire interdisciplinary expertise? So I, I, I'd be glad to. Uh, I actually even have more slides than that, but, but let, me not, let me not fish for that because it's, it's too awkward with all this technology. Let me just talk about it. We really look for people who will uh, be in, involved in projects that go from one group to another group. For example, I'm, I'm just giving you an example. 
uh, I, I saw a proposal recently from somebody from Professor W.E. Murner's group, who's obviously doing a wonderful microscopy, breaking the diffraction limit. But he's also working with somebody who's interested in, in mitosis, which is not what Professor Murner has expertise in. Professor Murner's expertise is much more in, in microscopy optics. And the person doing mitosis can't do anything without the, this ability to visualize. And, and together, students actually go back and forth between the groups, talk to each other, and come up with projects that matter to both groups. Am I making, uh, I hope I'm making clear to you the type of interaction. I, I've had others my, myself, but I'm just giving you an example. Uh, and so here you have somebody in a chemistry department interacting with somebody, it turns out, in the medical school. Okay? Uh, and that's not a normal thing. I, I'm very, I feel very fortunate at Stanford because the medical school is on the same campus as, as, as the, as the uh, sciences are. So it's, it's a matter of just walking <laughs> to get from one to the other. You don't have to take any transportation uh, to make these interactions go. There, there are many other examples of, of, of people who, who do computation with people who have very interesting problems as to how, do, how does blood circulate, the people who do fluid dynamics <clears throat> and people who do modeling. So th th these are the type of things that, that happen. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I'd like to expand a little more. So of course, of course. I just recently served on choosing the uh, uh, BioX uh, Fellowship. We get many, many applications, many more than we can fund. Uh, we look at the we look at the students. They make statements about the importance of the research. We get letters of support from the two from the mentors that want to work with them, and uh, we try to make an evaluation what will really have an impact and, and, and be successful and, and so forth. And it's always a hard choice, but they've been great outcomes as I tried to show you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Unless we have any more questions, I think I should say good morning and thank you for being here so early. Uh, the rest of us have had a long but very, very interesting day, and it's not over yet. But I think we should say uh, thank you to Richard, and uh, you can have, go and have breakfast and your coffee now. Thank you. Thank you so much.